So uh, the good thing is that uh, one doesn't have to uh, understand the whole mitosis at once. Uh, we have to really understand uh, all of the separate stages and then start um, sewing uh, models together. So I'll uh, go from one problem to another, uh, telling you about theoretical models, uh, what they contain, what they uh, don't do well, uh, and uh, by the end of the lectures, you'll hopefully uh, get uh, some gist of what's going on. So we'll start, for example, with problem one, uh, with this uh, parameter phase, with the search and capture process. Uh, then we'll go to problem number two, like what is the control mechanism for like when, when the cell allows the, for the glue to dissolve and chromosomes pulled apart. And then we'll go to the next problems and um, then we'll see what's going on. So uh, just to have a little break from serious stuff, uh, on YouTube, unfortunately, this, uh, uh, this specific site uh, disappeared recently, but I made a uh, few uh, shots from it. So it's, it's very dark because this, uh, this was those uh, the corresponding movie was, was made at night uh, at the uh, University of California, San Francisco. Some of the participants were naked, so they didn't want to, uh, uh, to sort of, um, have, a, have a lot of light there. So they, they found a swimming pool in California where everybody is very pinky, uh, which uh, uh, looks like a dividing cell. So the, this is the one future daughter cell, this is another future daughter cell. So two participants. Uh, were uh, playing the part of uh, centrosomes, the, 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 the focal points. And microtubules were this uh, uh, bright uh, plastic tubes, you know, to, uh, which kids like to uh, flow around. And uh, people at the equator between the cells uh, were uh, playing the parts of, uh, uh, of sister chromatids. So a pair of people sort of were holding hands. Uh, and so th those guys were waving, waving these tubes. Finally, uh, those guys were trying to catch the tubes uh, and uh, they, they get into metaphase, right? When uh, all the chromosomes are aligned, uh, each get corresponding uh, microtubule, then those guys started to pull. Uh, sister chromatids uh, let go of uh, sister hands and uh, pull together. So um, you can imagine that, of course, a lot of forces are involved here. You, you have to generate forces to generate all this motion. And the forces are generated by uh, special proteins called mod. So uh, you uh, normally, for, the, for physicists, it's an unpleasant to realize that uh, in uh, mitosis from types of motor. So as if uh, it's uh, not enough complexity, uh, even with one type of motor, it, will, it would be difficult to understand. But there are di uh, tons of different motors, and each of them are doing different things. Right? So we will learn uh, how these motors operate. And what, uh, what, why uh, the cell needs this complexity, why the cell needs all this uh, tons of different models. So this is uh, sort of the general um, uh, sort of philosophical plan uh, for the lecture. So let me first draw your attention uh, to this mural of Diego Rivera, which is one of my favorite artists. Um, so uh, in, uh, it's actually a fragment of the mural. In this mural, uh, the uh, proletarian hand uh, callous proletarian uh, and uh, folds uh, sort of a plate on which uh, you see the mitotic spindle and a set of clocks. So uh, Rivera was a very scientific-minded person and uh, he saw uh, all these um, uh, mysterious deep connections between uh, this microscopic uh, scientific world and our, our uh, big social world. So uh, here are the uh, themes which I want to discuss. Uh, there are these two notions of robustness and redundancy, which are uh, very uh, fashionable uh, these days. So crudely speaking, robustness uh, is um, the ability to uh, perform your task no matter what, no matter what noise and dis disturbance it is in the environment. Okay. Something like that. Um, to give you um, sort of an example, uh, you probably uh, read the story of how the uh, empire of Incas uh, fell a few centuries ago, uh, they, uh, they had tens of thousands of soldiers uh, which were defeated by uh, conquistador um, uh, Cortes, who had a few tens of soldiers. So there are different theories of why uh, this event happened. One of them is that uh, Cortes had, had his group organized in very robust ways, uh, meaning that 
uh, there, were, there was no rigid set of rules, and all, this, all these soldiers were desperately trying to survive and basically were operating, having only a general goal in mind, but no uh, specific rules for how to perform every little task. While uh, Inca soldiers were organized in a structure that was too rigid, they had all, every little move uh, subject to numerous rules. So one, uh, one of the tiny mechanisms in this uh, Inca's army was broken, the whole army fell apart. They didn't know uh, what to do. They tried to follow rules and could. Uh, that, of course, is a very uh, questionable explanation, but that's a certain <coughs> situation in the cell. In the cell, uh, millions of parts are broken every time, uh, all, all the time. And um, you still have to perform the task even with something broken. So to give you another example, uh, if, you have a, if you have a car, right, you know that one part breaks and the car doesn't drive. Uh, the cell cannot, uh, cannot work like that, because in the cell constantly something is broken. But still, the cell divides, uh, organism is healthy, so it has to do things differently from how the car does it. And this is called robustness. Uh, part of how this robustness is achieved is uh, this notion of redundancy. Uh, redundancy means that in a living cell, there's, uh, there are uh, a lot of different mechanisms that are doing the same thing. And you, see, you will see some of these examples uh, in uh, mitosis. So, um, and that's how the cell is different from the car. In the car, every, uh, so to, to make a, a proper fuel injection, there's just this one part. Uh, for it, if this part is broken, nothing works. The cell is like the car with 10 different types of carburetors there. If one of them breaks, another takes over. It's extremely wasteful, and this is one of the uh, pro, uh, reasons for the complexity I will describe. So the uh, part of the uh, complexity is because you need a lot of different ways to do the same thing. So then, um, this sort of uh, probably very clear to biologists. Uh, my big spindle, uh, the same as any uh, other biological machine is a very open system, uh, meaning that lots of molecules getting in, lots of molecules getting out of it, and there's tremendous flow of energy. In terms of energy, uh, cell is incredibly wasteful. So a lot of energy is uh, wasted to um, uh, phosphorylation, hydrolysis, and so on. Uh, each of those uh, phosphorylation and hydrolysis steps uh, normally is not needed, but it's all uh, to achieve this final goal. So uh, another thing uh, you'll see from the lecture is that uh, what Cell is trying to do is kind of what in control theory, which is uh, very fashionable in theoretical physics these days, is called multi-objective optimization. So the Cell uh, has to perform certain tasks, and not just to perform it. There are also uh, a lot of constraints. For example, this process of mitosis I was describing in the uh, first slide. Uh, it has to be done in certain time. Right? You can imagine that like embryo grows um, into adult uh, organism, uh, it has only like for human nine months for another organism, uh, other time. So uh, so many cell division have to, have to happen in this uh, nine months. So you, you don't have infinite time for this thing. So you have to do things fast. At the same time, you have to do things accurately. You'll see from the lectures that uh, it's very easy to make a mistake and drag a wrong uh, sister chromatid into wrong cell. And uh, that leads to cancer, death, and so on. And uh, so uh, even from our um, uh, common sense uh, point of view, uh, it's clear that you cannot be uh, at the same time very fast and very accurate. Right? If you try to do your job too fast, you'll make a lot of mistakes. If you do it 100% uh, perfect, you'll be too slow. So the cell has to. Uh, do some compromise. You'll see interesting examples of that. And finally, uh, it's sort of a uh, uh, sort of very Buddhist general thing. You'll see that everything is inter interconnected, everything is in impermanent. So as you say, the cell is constantly in this um, uh, tremendous flow. So let's start with uh, the parts. We have to understand how the parts work. And for us, uh, two main parts of the spindle are first is my tools, which I mentioned and second to understand molecular motors. So microtubules. As I mentioned, those are linear polymers. So at the simplest level of complexity, those uh, should be thought about as simply sticks, as sort of elastic rods. 
One important thing about them is that uh, those rods are polar. They have minus n and they have plus n. So uh, uh, we are not going to be discuss discussing minus n at all. Minus n is basically this static uh, end which is embedded into the central cell. It's kind of anchoring point, nothing interesting happening to it. However, uh, the dynamics of the plus m is really interesting. And uh, there are actually tens of uh, very interesting theoretical physics models of the plus m. Uh, and I'll tell you about one of the process. Before we do that, let's talk about the structure of microtubules. So from uh, the main, uh, you can kind of already get a hint that uh, it's actually a tube. Uh, the tube which, uh, with outer diameter about 25 nanometers, with inner diameter about 10 uh, nanometers, the characteristic length is normally a few microns. Uh, it is uh, approximately as hard as uh, plastic. Right? So it's kind of uh, this uh, elastic rod. Um, so the uh, tube consists of uh, so-called protofilaments. So protofilament is this a uh, simple uh, linear stick with plus and minus n. And where minus and plus n are coming from, uh, the uh, subunit, the brick from which uh, microtubule is built, is this uh, uh, so-called tuberin dimer. This is a globular protein consisting of uh, two uh, parts uh, of alpha tuberin and beta tuberin. And uh, in fact, uh, all the lectures you've heard so far uh, so what would uh, uh, Jose or Cecilia do uh, would uh, understand the folding uh, in physics of this dimer. Right? Uh, so we, we will be uh, concerned with a uh, much uh, grander uh, scale, but uh, for the price of uh, lesser understanding of details. So uh, the uh, tubular dimers bind to each other uh, so we head to tail, head to tail, so all this alpha uh, tuberin binds to beta tuberin and the, the last beta tuberin uh, makes plus n, uh, the first alpha tuberin makes minus n. And then uh, protofilaments stick laterally right, in certain chemical order uh, making this tube. Okay. So, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we are not going to discuss the minus n, but uh, the, the um, behavior of the plus n is called dynamic instability, which is really fascinating. So uh, for a while, uh, the uh, plus n is rowing. Right? If you uh, use um, a microscope to uh, follow the plus n, you'll see uh, the stage of growth. And then the, there'll be a event which is called catastrophe, when suddenly from growing, um, the plus n start to shrink. And then, uh, there's a event called rescue from shrinking stage, it starts growth again, and then again it catastroph catastrophes, and then starts growing, and on and on and on. This is sort of the, the real data. Um, so, um, the, there's uh, a lot of research, hundreds of papers uh, went into understanding the molecular mechanisms of uh, this dynamic instability process. Um, I'll just, in a couple of words, uh, tell you uh, how it works. So, um, this uh, tuberin dimers, when they're floating in the cytoplasm, uh, they uh, are always associated either with GDP or GTP, which, is, which are uh, relatives of ATP and ATP. So, crudely speaking, GTP is uh, kind of a gas ready to be burned, and uh, GDP is uh, burned uh, fumes. The cell, of course, uh, unlike uh, us, knows how to recharge, how to make, uh, how to exchange GDP for GTP. And there's a constant uh, flow of energy in the cell like that. So the, the point is, if you have a lot of GTP uh, dimers at the plus end of microtubules, uh, GTP dimers uh, tend to attract uh, other GTP dimers rapidly so that uh, plus end is growing. And it's, it's growing in a very complicated fashion. There's this seam uh, between uh, two adjacent protofilaments, which is kind of uh, uh, seals uh, together, and uh, plus end is growing. And then uh, this part of G, uh, dimers, uh, the plus and tip, which are associated with GTP, is called GTP cap. So what's happening? You have growth here, right? But you also have hydrolysis. 
here. So those uh, GTP uh, dimers get hydrolyzed. They become GDP. Uh, and so you have this boundary between GTP and GDP uh, kind of racing with uh, polymerization process. That's both are stochastic processes. And when GTP, GDP boundary uh, suddenly gets to the plus end, there's catastrophe. GTP, uh, GDP dimers at the plus end, they uh, cannot uh, per assemble quickly uh, the dimers. So the microtable starts to fall apart. And it falls apart like peeling the banana. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the point is that this protofilaments of GDP uh, dimers, uh, they first of all are not sticky. They don't like to stick laterally together. And second, they don't uh, like to be straight. They sort of prefer elastic configuration in which they are like, uh, um, like forks. Uh, and so banana is peeled, and there's a catastrophe and shrinkage until, uh, by chance, oops, uh, you, have, uh, you have enough GTP dimers, by chance, binding here, recovering into this stage. So there's this process. As I said, there are tremendous amount of both theoretical and um, experimental work just about that. So I wanted to uh, show you a very simple um, theoretical model of this dynamic stability. Um, I probably can actually run, uh, skip uh, the slide. It basically tells you that uh, what you have to do to understand um, the dynamic instability is simply bookkeeping. So you um, sort of figure out what's the probability to find uh, the growing plus n at certain uh, coordinate at certain time. Uh, and uh, clearly you lose such ends because they grow and go into the next position, uh, but from uh, previous position are uh, growing and get here, so you gain those, you lose due to catastrophe and you gain due to rescue. And so you uh, do all this um, uh, bookkeeping and derive uh, a system of partial differential equations uh, which describe uh, probability to have uh, growing uh, plus n at x at time t and probability to have uh, shrinking and the text of t. And so for you to understand uh, this uh, partial differential equations, those are very easy linear uh, partial differential equations. The first terms are so-called drift or attraction <coughs> terms. Uh, this describes uh, movement uh, to the right of the growing plus m. This describes movement to the left of shrinking plus m. And those uh, reaction terms describe exchange between uh, shrinking and growing face with uh, catastrophe and rescue frequencies uh, C and R. Okay. How do you solve this system of equations? It's uh, very simple. First, uh, you of course would be interested in steady state. What happens when everything is stabilized? Uh, so you take all this uh, partial time derivatives, uh, make them zero, and then you have a system of ordinary differential equations, right hand side are equal to zero. Uh, and uh, then you um, see that those equations are linear, so the idea is to substitute solution uh, in terms of exponents. Uh, and for the exponent, you don't know this uh, numerical parameter L, which has parameter of length. So after you substitute uh, this mathematical form, uh, instead of a differential equation, you get system of algebraic equations. Uh, and uh, this system is homogeneous, it has non-trivial solution only if determinant of the coefficient matrix of this system uh, is equal to zero. So it's all sort of elementary uh, stuff, so I'm going through this quickly. Uh, when you check this condition, uh, you derive this formula for uh, this unknown parameter, which if you look at this formula, what, it, what does it mean? It means that you expect exponential distribution of microtubule lens in the steady state, meaning there'll be a lot of short microtubules, right? and uh, fewer and fewer longer microtubules. And this parameter L tells you what's the average length of microtubule. Okay. So uh, what is extremely important in um, uh, biological physics is not just to mathematically derive those formula, but to understand uh, what's the biological lessons from them. So if you look at this formula, the first thing that sort of jumps into your mind, so here, d minus is the rate of shrinking, d plus 
is the rate of growing, so both are positive parameters, catastrophe rate and rescue rate. So uh, L should be, of course, positive. Right? Uh, it only can be positive if uh, this term is greater than that term. Right? You have this um, uh, inequality. We can rewrite it in this form. Now let's think what, what those uh, ratios mean. So this is rate of shrinking. 1 over R is average duration of uh, shrinking. Right? Uh, so V minus divided by uh, R is the uh, average length by which my shrinks on shrinks. Uh, right? And then V plus over uh, C, similarly, this is um, the average growing length. So you have, on the average, to shrink more than you grow. Right? So you always shrink uh, great length and recover small length. In deterministic world, right, it sort of clearly what would happen eventually you shrink to zero and that, that would be it. But this is stochastic process. So if you follow uh, this stochastic process, in the end you have magnitude of certain finite length, which you will help. Okay. Um, what happens if you don't have this, uh, this inequality? One, well, qualitatively it's easy to understand. Uh, you will grow on the average more than you shrink. So then, if you wait long enough, you'll have infinite length microtubule. Of course, in biology, nothing is infinite. What basically will happen, microtubules will be bumping into the uh, boundary of the cell. So micro most of the microtubules will be incredibly, will be as long as the cell itself. So that's a very important uh, thing. Um, so it was uh, done in the paper of uh, Dr. Ramon Weiber about 15 years ago. And this is an example of how really simple uh, physics uh, can help. It was a big hit in the biological world. They, they didn't understand this. So uh, just understanding this thing is important and, um, and easy. So uh, next, let's go to molecular motors. So uh, molecular motors are uh, these amazing proteins uh, which are able to uh, generate movement and force. And so here, for example, is uh, artist rendering of the structure of kinesin, one of the best uh, studied motors. So this uh, molecule is able to move from uh, plus to uh, from minus to plus n uh, of the microtubule. And uh, what is very interesting, uh, its structure is uh, kind of similar to our body. It has uh, so what is a little bit confusing. Uh, the, the parts which burn ATP and which are actually engines are called uh, heads in biological literature, but the best analogy to understand how it works is to think of them as uh, legs and feet. So uh, feet are basically uh, those uh, heads, right, uh, and legs are uh, those necks connecting feet to the body. And so uh, it just moves uh, foot over foot, so the molecular motor just walks like that literally. And it always walks in one direction. So uh, this is minus n, this is plus n. And the steps uh, of the, uh, so this asymmetry makes steps. And uh, the head can only bind one way. So it cannot bind this way. So the motor only can do this. So what I, what I did after that, I turned around and retraced my step. The motor can, cannot do it. It can, in principle, do this. Go this way and then go that way. But uh, that would require to remember force, and uh, I'll explain to you what happens in that case. So what actually happens uh, often in, in the cell, one motor moves this way, then another motor, which prefers to move that way, gets this motor on, the, on its back and moves it that way. And then they change, so it's like piggybacking symbiosis. So what's the physics uh, behind this? Um, Crudely speaking, uh, the motor can be, uh, the, this protein can be in three conformations. And uh, sort of, the first conformation is like that, the second conformation is like that, and the third conformation is like that. So the idea is to go uh, one, two, three. Right. Uh, that's, uh, but the problem with it, uh, if you don't spend any uh, energy, you cannot do that. Uh, because, uh, the, yeah? Right, right. So, yeah. So, uh, hand over, uh, like feet over feet or head over head, 
That's how uh, Keynesian is believed to be moving. This is just a sort of explanation of the principle. However, there are some motors like that also. And uh, there are even some people are arguing that that's how Keynesian is moving. So according to uh, thermodynamical principle, if you don't spend any energy, you have equal rates uh, of uh, sort of cycling this way in the cycle or that way in the cycle. So without spending energy, it will be just uh, fluctuating along the polymer without the bias. However, if you spend energy, you can make this process irreversible. And this is a sort of crude explanation of how it could be. You have a pocket uh, somewhere here. Uh, when you get into this conformation, this pocket is wide open. And uh, ATP uh, goes into this pocket. And then when ATP is hydrolyzed, so there is some violent change in the uh, conformation. And then you get into this configuration. And then when you release, uh, and relax you get into this conformation. And then because you spent energy, for example, this step is irreversible. You cannot undo phosphorylation uh, by uh, this motor itself. So um, there's, uh, as I mentioned, the complexity is that there's tens of different kinds of motors. Uh, they all are kind of bumped together into families according to sort of the, the genetic origin. Uh, huge families called kinesians. Most of them move from minus to plus ends. Um, they all have different properties, but they are very related. So the protein structure of each of them is very similar to the other. Uh, and there's a family of dynians which move from plus ends <coughs> to minus ends. Right? So uh, one of the simplest things uh, the motors are, are used for is transport. So they, they grab cargo which are normally big vesicles containing proteins move from one part of the cell to the other, then Benians grab another cargo which actually contains kinesians, move it all back, and so on. So uh, let's, um, let me uh, tell you a little bit about the physics of this uh, motor uh, movement. So the physics of molecular motor is a very well established area with hundreds of papers published about them. There are two principal mechanisms of generating force uh, and movement for, for the motor. For, um, uh, by molecular motors. One of the very elegant one is called uh, thermal ratchet. Okay. And um, it's a, a very elegant concept which actually is proved experimentally. Here's how it works. So um, in molecular ratchet, the, this uh, cycle of burning ATP is coupled not to actual physical production of the forces, but to changing of interaction uh, between between the foot and the substrate on which the motor is moving. So in one um, nucleotide state, uh, the motor uh, sees kind of very flat um, uh, potential surface. So it's, it's almost flat, there are almost no steps here. And as a result of that, uh, there's a uh, huge uninhibited uh, thermal Brownian movement along this landscape. But then, the switch is turned, and then um, in another nucle nucleotide state, the interaction between uh, this foot, which was dangling like that in this state, uh, interaction of it with the substrate is suddenly uh, changed. Instead of flat surface, it sees uh, very sharp um, steps uh, consisting of mild slope and steep slope. And then suddenly, after dangling, right, you are attracted to the minimum in uh, the surface. So uh, think about what happens. Let's say you are here. You just move anywhere, right? And then suddenly the switch occurs. You are here, right? Then you fall into the slope and roll down into this minimum. If you fall here, you roll down into that minimum. But on the average, clearly, you fall on this slope more often because they are longer. And always, kind of, the bias would be you roll from right to left not from right to right, uh, left to right. From left to right would be very uh, um, uh, infrequent. So as a result, you mostly move uh, from left to right. So, sorry, from right to left. Uh, when you switch constantly between those two. So you kind of spend uh, energy not on producing the force. So now if you try to stop the motor, apply the force a little bit in this direction, on average it would move still this way, but slower. 
So you can kind of start producing force. The motor would move against the force, uh, but this force is not produced directly. The force is produced to bias uh, random thermal movement. Uh, and another mechanism called power stroke uh, is uh, pretty much what you would expect. It's like the springs in the lab. And uh, those springs are charged or released based on nucleotide state. So in one nucleotide state, you uh, sort of tense the legs. Uh, in another, you unglue one of your foot and the spring move the foot in the next position, and so on. So uh, all molecular motors, it's now uh, here, actually uh, combine both mechanisms. And uh, it's just different percentage uh, that, uh, of the mechanism, which is power stroke and tragic mechanism. So one important um, thing you can understand without going deep into the details of the physics is um, figure out uh, what, what kind of force can you generate this way. The force uh, is simply the energy that uh, you spend divided by uh, the step, divided by the distance uh, per one step of the motor. And the step is simply uh, length of one uh, microtubule dimer. Right? It's, it's one step above the microtubule. So uh, the length of the dimer is uh, about 8 nanometers. And uh, energy depends. If it's uh, thermal inertia, then it's uh, famous KBT, uh, Boltzmann constant times absolute temperature. This is thermal energy that any molecule uh, has. Uh, this energy is 4 pi newton times nanometers. So with thermal ratchet, you would get about 25 pi newton. Or if you burn ATP, ATP uh, energy is order of 80 pi newton times nanometers. So you can get 10 pi newton. So you can imagine that uh, you get pi newton uh, order of force. So pi newton is characteristic scale of force in molecular biology and cell biology. Um, and so, uh, next, I wanted to explain to you an uh, extremely important notion about um, molecular motors. Uh, uh, here, again, you don't have to follow uh, the details, but you have to understand sort of the general principle. So, what this uh, part of the slide is showing is uh, one of the, uh, it's actually, I think, dominating idea about this motion of kinesium, uh, and this is called mechanochemical cycle. Right? So this uh, combination of two words, mechanochemical, is uh, really important. That's what uh, all the physical efforts in cell biology will be. So uh, what cell does consists of chemistry, meaning uh, all this network of chemical reaction, and mechanics of actually physical movement and forces. Both are coupled at any level. So uh, ultimate goal is to understand this mechanic mechanochemistry of the living cell. So in this case, it's one of the simplest, the simplest examples. Uh, you have uh, geometric and physical configurations of this uh, protein coupled to uh, different nucleotide states, coupled to chemistry. And so transition from state to state is both chemical reaction and mechanical stuff. So you can kind of condense uh, this long uh, process into, let's say, two characteristic steps, uh, two characteristic states. Uh, all the others are uh, sort of sequence of transitions between the others, very fast. And those are sort of two slow steps. Uh, one of them goes to the rate K1, which is independent of the external force. So you can apply the force to the motor, try to change the rates. But this step wouldn't be changed by force. Why? Because uh, this step happens without uh, changing the position of the motor. So external force doesn't do anything. <coughs> However, the second step, which sort of uh, closes the cycle, uh, is slowed down by the force. Because the st second step involves actual physical stepping forward. And when you're stepping forward, uh, like, let's say without external force, you have this uh, free energy configuration. So this is beginning of the step, and this is the end of the step. And there was some uh, rate K2, 0, Right, for, uh, of transition from this state into that state. Now, you uh, alter this rate by uh, this exponential Boltzmann factor, uh, which is e to the minus external force times length of the step over kBT. So this is uh, famous Arrhenius law. The rate of reaction is changing uh, because the force uh, starts slowing it down. Uh, and then you write just uh, equations, you can call it uh, Markov chain or 
uh, simplistically it just transition from step to step and uh, estimate the velocity of movement which is the rate with which uh, you're stepping uh, times the probability to be in this position from which you're stepping times the uh, length of the step substitute all this simple math in, into here and so the bottom line is that average velocity that, with, with which the motor will be walking depends on the force which you apply right? so then you can plot uh, the graph which shows you how velocity depends on the force and this is called force velocity relation which is very easy to understand so without force applied to you, you move with certain velocity right? now somebody tries to stop me, I'll start moving slower so your velocity will go down uh, with force. It's actually also possible to apply the force, sort of pushing you down a little faster. So all molecular motors are like that. Um, this force velocity was measured uh, in a previous decade, uh, and it was a big, uh, big achievement of experimental um, uh, biophysics. So for example, this is measured force velocity curve for um, uh, kinesin. Uh, it's measured actually um, Dr. Fire already explained it, uh, to you before me how it's done so one of the elegant experiments you have optical trap uh, which is a uh, laser beam and uh, the bead, uh, plastic bead is trapped in the laser beam so if, uh, because the light of the laser is deflected when it passes through, through, through the beam there is effective force pulling the bead into the very center of the uh, laser beam and uh, the effective spring constant which is pulling uh, deep to the center is uh, of the uh, order of uh, like a few piganewtons per uh, micron so following the position uh, of the bead how far it is from the center of the laser you can measure piganewton uh, level of forces so uh, this is the position of the trap which is moved with constant rate and this is position of the bead so the distance between uh, those two curves is proportional to the force so uh, changing the velocity of the trap uh, you change this force and that's how uh, Steve Block and his group measure the force velocity curve so that was uh, one of the greatest achievements of experimental biophysics of the 20th century so uh, do you have any questions at that point? Um, that's an excellent question. So I'm not going to talk about recessivity of the motors at all, um, but um, it's an important question. So the motors can only make certain number of steps and then they detach. There are sort of two extreme cases. Kinesian is one of the most processive motors. It makes thousands of steps before it's detaching. So in a way, its main um, purpose is to make, uh, to generate movement, not, not to generate force. While myosin, the protein which contracts uh, muscle, uh, is uh, the another extreme. <coughs> it makes one step, it immediately detaches, it basically slaps uh, the filament in which it moves, slap, uh, detach, slap, detach, slap, detach. So it can work only when hundreds of myosin at the same time are slapping this uh, filament filament is slowly moving um, so in, uh, in the spindles mo most of the motors are moderately process processive they uh, make tens to hundreds of steps on the detach so they, they can generate force and they can generate some of the movements so now what are the, the motors doing in the spindle well uh, they, uh, as I mentioned, generate uh, force of movement. So let me give you a few examples. Uh, here's the characteristic uh, picture of the spindle. So those are poles. Uh, those are microtubules reaching to the uh, boundaries, uh, boundary of the cells. Those are microtubules connecting uh, poles to the uh, chromosomes. And what is not shown uh, in this picture, some uh, microtubules go uh, sort of to neither the boundaries of the cell nor the, sun, uh, nor the chromosomes they meet in the middle and overlap like that and then the motor is doing fascinating thing there's uh, one motor 
So uh, let's say this, this is the motor domain and this is the body. And another motor binding to it like that. So two motors now, you, you have the structure with uh, motor domains on, on both sides. And so uh, those motors, for example, try uh, to move to uh, minus end of the microtubule, which is at the pole. Uh, and those also try to move to uh, minus end of the microtubule. So then, if you have two microtubules, these are plus ends, these are minus ends. So uh, the motors are trying to move here and here. And what they do is uh, this, right? So they try to pull the poles together. There's uh, another uh, motors which are opposite. They try to move to plus ends, and then motor tries to move here, tries to move here, so they try to do that. So they slide uh, microtubules apart, they elongate the spindle, as you saw it happens in the other case. So this is one of the functions of the motors. Uh, another functions, uh, function, microtubules reaching the boundary of the cell, right, and converse motors which either pull or push uh, microtubules. So uh, this motor, for example, tries to move uh, to the plus end of microtubule, and so microtubule is reaching for the surface, um, it tries to move this way, so it pushes the microtubule away. So it generates uh, the force which is pushing microtubule away. Or uh, the motor trying to move to plus uh, to minus end, it will be pulling microtubule, reading microtubule in. Okay. So uh, those motors, are, those are normally dynamics and other kinds, they are trying either to pull microtubule and the spindle pole with it or push it away. And the greatest complexity is here. So there are some microtubules connecting the uh, spindle pole and the uh, chromosome. Right? So uh, at the spindle pole, uh, what happens, there are special motors, which are called depolymerase motors. They chew, they eat minus end of microtubule. And at the same time, they sort of reel it in. So it's like basically a pencil sharpener. They eat it and fill it in, eat it and fill it in. So they, uh, by this action, they pull, uh, trying to pull the chromosome to the, to the respective spindle pole. Uh, those are assisted by uh, motors, which are trying to drag uh, the chromosome along the microtubule to the pole. And both of these types are assisted by uh, depolymerases of plus end, so they chew uh, apart the plus ends uh, so that the plus end is not bumping into chromosome and not stopping it from moving to the pole. So there are millions of things that motors do, and here uh, about 10 uh, important um, motors all doing different things. There are hundreds of copies of each motor in the spindle, and each of this motor is switched on and switched off at specified time by a network of proteases, ligases, phosphatases, kinases. So you, you can get a glimpse of this uh, tremendous complexity. And hopefully by um, the end of the lectures uh, tomorrow, I'll uh, show you that approaching all this quantitative view, you can actually sort out uh, all these multiple actions and see what all of them are doing. Um, okay, so um, let me finish this sort of general part, introductory part of the lectures with um, showing you the slide again, showing you sort of the, uh, where we are at the complex complexity scale. So systems complexity is, um, and this is sort of the level of model, uh, model abstraction on this axis. So structure of tubulin and motors, basically structure of proteins, which you learned in previous few days, is here. It's uh, the simplest on the level of complexity, but uh, it's also very detailed. And then uh, if you want to move up the molecular structure and then dynamic instability and movement of motors, uh, you're getting into more and more complex things, uh, but then your models are becoming more and more abstract, and fewer and fewer details in that. What I will focus uh, on is uh, those two parts. When we get into self-organizing motor microtubule networks and uh, architecture of the whole spindle. And this is incredible complexity, as I mentioned, but at the same time, the models will be very abstract. There are relatively little detail there. Uh, 
besides uh, mitotic spindle, very similar structures are appearing in many other uh, areas of biology. For example, here the uh, cell is showing, which is grows on the surface. And uh, what the epidural aster is doing is the following. So this spider-like structure is, this is one center cell in front of the nucleus. And it sends microtubules to the leading edge of the cell. So uh, molecular motors are dragging uh, signaling proteins from the nucleus to the leading edge. And the signaling uh, proteins telling the leading edge to uh, send out active network and basically move in this direction. So microtubule cluster is the steering wheel of the cell. Just an example. All right, so uh, let me tell you just like today we'll finish with a uh, model of one of the processes. Do you have any questions about this introductory part? Yeah. So I'll explain to you about a uh, permanent phase about search and capture. As I mentioned, this is the process uh, in which uh, um, nuclear envelope dissolves and microtubules are starting to hunt for, uh, um, for uh, sister chromatids or chromosomes. So mechanistically how it works, I mentioned to you that there are droplets of glue between the sister chromatids. At the opposite sides, there are these organelles called kinetochores. So those are other droplets of glue which are waiting for the microtubule. Whenever microtubule bumps into the uh, kinetochore, into this droplet of glue, it gets glued to it and then makes a connection. Okay. And then uh, it is said that microtubule captures uh, the, the chromosome. So that's how it works. You start with unattached sister chromatids. The, uh, these chromosomes have kinet uh, kinetochores. Whenever microtubule bumps into this kinetochore, it makes a connection called capture. So this was qualitative uh, search and capture model uh, suggested 20 years ago. And the idea was that this process is completely random. So um, let's say this is center zone, this is microtubule. This is the target microtubule wants to capture. So the microtubule goes here, 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 randomly. Right. When by chance bumps the target, gets glued, you, you capture, you break. Okay. So here's the question. Uh, in order to do it fast, what are the parameters of dynamic instability you should, uh, you should choose? And even without math from the common sense, you probably shouldn't rescue your, your microtubule for, for the following reason. Uh, microtubules cannot turn in the cell. It only can grow, shrink to zero, and then grow in the different direction. Why? Because it's growing not in the liquid cytoplasm. It's growing in an enormous scaffold inside the cell called the cytoskeleton. So it, it can turn and sort of capture it in, in this network. So if you start rescuing, and if you draw in the wrong direction, uh, you'll be sitting in this wrong direction forever. You'll never turn in the right direction. So you should shrink to zero, start from scratch. Second, you shouldn't grow too long. Right? Why? Because imagine you're growing in the wrong direction. And you grow and you grow and you grow, wasting time. Right? You should grow in a different direction. You should shrink and start in the new direction. At the same time, you cannot grow too short. Because imagine you grow, this would be the, the, the most uh, sort of uh, unpleasant, um, most um, disappointing thing. You grow in the right direction, and right before you get there, you start shrinking. You can imagine, so those guys who produced this um, thing, they had a lot of uh, sexual union in, in this paper. It was, it was very, a lot of fun to read. So uh, you shouldn't grow too long, shouldn't grow too short, should grow right, uh, basically, to the target. So what, what does it really mean, mathematically? Um, so uh, here's uh, the very simple mathematical theory which explains what, what the cell should do. Uh, let's estimate the time, uh, average time, uh, before the capture of, of your target. Uh, let's say that P is the probability to grow into the um, right direction and not only uh, right. So probability for a successful search. Basically, you grow to the right direction and you capture the target. Uh, and let's say uh, TS is time of the successful search. Uh, so 
what can happen? Well, you can get very lucky and get your target from the first search. Then your time would be probability of the, of the successful search times the time of the successful search. But most, most likely not. Most likely you, you'll miss first time. Uh, probability to miss is 1 minus key, right? Key probability of the successful search, 1 minus key probability of unsuccessful search. So unsuccessful, but second time you'll be successful. Product of two probabilities times the time of successful search plus time of unsuccessful search. So that would be the time uh, of the second uh, or you can get more unlucky. Miss first two times, get it the third time. Then probability to miss first two times, get it the third time, times the total time, and so on. Right? And so then you sum the, uh, uh, all, all this uh, times factored by probability. So this is elementary probability theory. And then it's just elementary math. Uh, this is uh, uh, geometric progression. You sum it get uh, uh, this expression, then use certain uh, strong inequalities, and ta -dum, ta -dum, ta -dum. so you, you use uh, some results of the dynamic instability uh, distribution of uh, micro length to get to the final formula. The average uh, search time is basically uh, this formula, which is L is the average length to which micro people grow. D is the distance to the target. Uh, Q is a uh, sort of geometric parameter of how big is kinetic uh, point, how far it is, and V is the uh, growth rate. So uh, looking at this formula, it's very easy to understand uh, without, even without calculus the following. This time is increasing uh, because of this factor. So the longer is my critical, the greater is the time, because then you spend a lot of time on, on these unsuccessful searches. But there's also this uh, exponential factor, which is uh, a reflection of the part that you, you, you should get, get at least to the target. So according to this L, the greater uh, the L is, right, the smaller this factor is. So you plot uh, this time as a function of L. And as expected, there's minimum. So, uh, and this minimum is exactly when A is equal to D. Okay. So, uh, common sense is uh, supported by math. You should grow on the average exactly to the target. Okay. Uh, and uh, the cell actually does it because uh, according to uh, the realistic parameters, uh, if you have this constraint, you would capture your chromosome in 10 minutes. An experimental observation that that is exactly the duration of uh, metaphase, 10, 20 minutes. So if you uh, screw up this condition, then you, especially in this direction, then there could be really disastrous consequences that you will be too slow assembling this people. However, this is just a, be just a beginning. So this was done more than 10 years ago in this pioneering paper by Florian and Jeff Leiter. So um, here's the problem, though. This paper tells you what happens if you have one microtubule and one chromosome. Now, what happens if you have many chromosomes or for characteristic animal cells, tens of chromosomes, and you have hundreds of microtubules? That's again an experimental fact. Hundreds of microtubules are searching in space. So it, it's easy to understand the following qualitatively without math. The more microtubules you have, the better. Right? It's one of them will get the chromosome. But the more chromosomes you get, uh, it's, it's actually getting bad because uh, you always wait until the last one will be captured. And due to stochasticity, it, it could not be so easy. So uh, there's an interesting mathematical fact that the time goes up as the number of chromosomes as the logarithm of the number of chromosomes. Uh, I um, cannot simply ex explain that why, but it's um, sort of it's fact from reliability theory. Like let's say there. 30, 30 light bulbs uh, here in this room. Lifetime of light bulb is, let's say, two years. Right? So on each individual lamp, uh, you wait until it uh, goes broke for two years. If there's no maintenance, how much time do you wait until the light bulb, the last bulb, dies? Uh, answer is two years times the logarithm of the number of lamps. So it's the same. 
Um, and also, there's a, you can imagine there's a geometric factor. Like, um, let's say the chromosome is here, right? So you can fine-tune the uh, catastrophe and rescue parameters to get this chromosome fast. But what about my uh, chromosome here? It has different distances. So you cannot optimize the search for all chromosomes. And that's bad, because some of the chromosomes are in very unlikely position. So after that, all you can do is just simulate uh, with the computer the search and capture process, right? And uh, see how much time uh, do you wait until the last uh, chromosome gets captured. It's a very easy Monte Carlo simulation. You just uh, code in the computer the rules. You grow, you shrink, you go from shrinking to growth, from growth to shrinking, very easy. Uh, after we did the simulation, we found that you have to wait, uh, on average, uh, hundred, like more than 100 minutes, right? while the cell does it in about 10, 20, 30 minutes. So uh, the conclusion from that is that the cell doesn't do this process of search and capture randomly. Somehow, uh, it has a hint where chromosomes are. And that's, uh, that's a puzzle. Like how does the cell know? So the uh, hypothesis we had was that uh, there's a certain chem uh, cloud of chemical around the um, chromosomes. In a way, chromosomes are sweating, the sweat has smell, and the microtubules can sense the smell. It's the process called chemotaxis. Uh, microtubules are able to go up the gradient of certain chemical. So the best candidate for uh, this smelly stuff is the uh, protein called RAN. And uh, as usual, it can be in two configurations, either with GTP or GDP attached. And uh, so how this cloud is created is a very elegant uh, process, which, is, which now people discover everywhere in the cell. So lots of places in the cell where, where there's chemical clouds. Uh, the exchange of GDP, GDP on GTP happens only on the chromosomes, because the kinases, which make this process possible, sit on the arms of the chromosomes. Everywhere else in the cytoplasm, phosphatases flow around. So those phosphatases uh, make the opposite switch. So you activate the protein, it starts floating off, and then it gets like deactivated. And then even without math, you can understand that there will be cloud of this stuff near the chromosomes and less and less of it away from it. There's actually um, very interesting math behind it, but I'll skip it because I'm running out of time. And you can sort of, uh, on your own, look at this uh, slide later. I can, I don't know, somehow transfer all these slides to you. And uh, see that because of, because of this process, you, you have exponentially dying cloud around the chromosomes. And so then the hypothesis was that uh, microtubules can smell this cloud and basically uh, they uh, grow only inside the cloud or are actually biased inside the cloud. So we made another simulation where microtubules were biased and found that uh, this accelerates search and capture 10 times. And that's exactly what's needed. Then the cell makes an assembly in 11 minutes instead of um, like 50 minutes <coughs> here. And that's uh, pretty much what was observed. Um, so this, um, let me just keep this slide also. Let me uh, tell you uh, the following though. So uh, there's a competing hypothesis from other groups uh, who are saying that, uh, well, maybe the cell uh, doesn't do uh, just that. So it, it's not the search and capture. Maybe the cell does smarter things. The smarter thing is to grow microtubules from the chromosomes, not from the uh, centrosomes, but grow them from kinetochores exactly. And then you focus those microtubules into the poles, get them to the uh, centrosomes. That was sort of very uh, unorthodox suggestion. However, recently, uh, it was actually observed experimentally that in some cells, something like that happens. So uh, you, you have the centrosome with this uh, microtubules coming out of it, but also there were some microtubules growing from kinetochores and getting focused, uh, and then those uh, local focal points were pulled together into the uh, pole. And um, there was really a brilliant paper uh, three years ago uh, where this process was modeled. And I wanted to mention uh, the work of this group because I'll be uh, uh, referring to it 
uh, again and again. So in, in our group, we have this approach when we work with equations. We sort of make simplifications, right, uh, partial differential equations, or we use some simple Monte Carlo simulations. This group, uh, which is a group of Francois and Nederek in uh, Heidelberg, they're saying, let's not make any simplifications. We'll exactly model each microtubule, each individual motor. And so there are tens of thousands of them, and we'll just code the rules, uh, mechanical rules of microtubules and motors, and just see what happens. So basically, they have what is called fashionably with this in silico modeling. Right? You just model uh, exactly what you think happens in nature, red, 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 round. You don't even have to understand why this is so, what's happening. At the output, you, you, you have your result. And in this case, it was very appropriate thing. So they actually modeled this uh, uh, kinetic core fibers growing. Uh, they modeled the process of uh, how molecular motors grab uh, neighboring fibers, and then motors walk to plus or minus sense and start focusing these fibers, and how microtubules from the center zones growing can bump into one of these fibers, grab it by another motor, and uh, drag all these fibers together. Okay. And uh, the result of this simulation uh, was basically showing that uh, it all can work in time that biologists observe. So um, let me finish with uh, the following uh, interesting estimate, which brings me to one of the philosophical points from which I started uh, this talk. Is it also innocent? Uh, well, turns out, no. Uh, the cell, in fact, makes a lot of mistakes when uh, in the process of the search and capture. And here's the, the worst mistake it can make. So this is the proper connection, which is called, called uh, amphoteric. It means that left mitotic pole get left sister, right pole get right sister, and then they'll get pulled to opposite poles. And then there are some kind of innocent uh, errors. Uh, in the next picture, I'll tell you why they're innocent and really bad error, when you, uh, which is called neurotelic, when you have one of the kinetochores uh, captured from opposite poles, and then the cell doesn't know where to pull it. How, do, how can you make this mistake? Well, very simply, uh, you, you cannot orient all the chromosomes properly. So uh, some of the chromosomes are oriented so that both kinetochores are see, seen from opposite poles. For example, this kinetochore can be seen from here and from here. 